Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining the program and thank you, Ava, for the uh, introduction of all the work that we did. Uh, my name is Ren Galvin and I am presenting first. And I started this project um, looking into the archives with a really simple reflection of like, what communities do I belong to and how can I encounter them in the archives of the Sheldon? I began with a search for men. I'm a queer person. I am Latinx and I'm also from Texas, but I thought that would be a good entry port to see what kind of information would be returned. And what was so interesting about engaging with the materials of the Sheldon was that there were a lot of online search menus available. So I started looking for images and um, you have to type in like the subject matter you wanna see. And as I did this and it returned like hundreds of pictures of men, what was striking to me as I sort of like perused all the images was the fact that there were a lot of men with animals. Um, I couldn't find in my own little uh, folder of images, the initial image that caught my attention, which was a hunter that had a dead rabbit in their hand. And it was so striking because I live in Medford and I'm right next to the Mystic Res River Reservation. And when I go on my afternoon or evening walks, I see rabbits all over. So it resonated with me and like, wow, this is a real interesting way of encountering information. But what else am I gonna see as I go through all of these images and, and trying to figure out where, where men are, what men are doing and, and how are they being shown in the, in the archive? Um, oh, sorry. Um, again, as I was looking through these images, one of the things that also struck me was how unpresent men were in the images that were attributed to them. So this was another image that was part of my search. And when I looked at the metadata, the values that help you find information in the archive when you're using online resources, the first element which was listed was men. And then in a further description, it said that they were in the background walking away. And so if you look in this image, you can see sort of on the horizon, uh, you see two separate groups on either end. And I believe both of them are men. What wasn't really highlighted initially was this image of two women. Um, and as a queer person, I was really attracted to this image because I'm like, oh, what a random encounter, um, how something might just be hidden in plain sight. But I don't know these people and I don't know how to tell their story because I'm coming to the table with a very contemporary lens and a contemporary way of seeing queerness. And and I haven't done the work to really excavate how you can interpret a queer presence in in historical images, especially those that might be encountered the way that I was in the archive. But this idea of randomly encountering things because of the information that was attributed to the images started to really resonate with me louder than necessarily the community that I belong to and am trying to reflect in my work. Um, so I kind of put those two things together in thinking about like, well, animals are really important and they represent something about the way that we sort of inhabit the world that we're in. They show us in many ways how to be, especially if you don't know what's going on, right? So like when there's earthquakes, animals scurry and they, they seek shelter in bad weather. Um, animals tell you when they're hungry. So there's this real sense of physicality to things that isn't necessarily present, but you can always tell. And the way that animals are being shown had a lot to do with trophies, had a lot to do with value. And so I kind of kept on this path of looking through images and started going into the newspapers, for which I'm especially attracted to. Like I grew up as a kid going to a library, reading newspapers with my grandfather. And again, and trying to make sense of this idea of queer community, did a search in the archives for keywords. Queer was the first one. And I got this ad that randomly showed up on a page for circuses, which I thought was interesting. And it said, had a queer dream last night, tell it. I dreamed that I made, made an appointment with myself. And when I got to the place, I was gone. And that started to begin this process of thinking about well, what will my work look like as I do this? And how can I think about occupying a space in this archive with the research that I wanna present as I sort of delved further and further into looking for information on animals and the kinds of animals that were happening, it was really striking to me that you had circuses coming into Vermont. You had a, a real global presence of things that were being brought into the space so that people can be entertained, so that people can have something to do um, on top of their routines. 
Uh, in this search, one of the things that I thought was really interesting was as I typed in a keyword in the newspapers, they had little boxes, these bounding boxes that I think we understand to be like, this is important. This is helping me see what I wanted to look for and not really showing me all the other elements. So my attention had to really kind of focus in not just on the word, but what was it surrounding and how was it being presented? And things like menagerie, circus, zoo, all had these very interesting representations of animals. And it was really kind of entertaining and exciting and it brought me back to my own childhood. But I'm also left with this idea of like, well, if we are thinking about animals and community that this is beyond human as a title suggests, then like, what are we actually trying to engage with? What are the currents then that are informing the way that we're encountering information in the archive and the way that animals are an element that may suggest what happens when we're no longer here. Um, in order to manifest my own work, I kind of honed in on one particular image and looked at this uh, um, elephant being paraded through, I think this is, I forget what city it is. Um, and what I really enjoyed the most about this is working with it as a digital image. Uh, while I did have conversations with Eva and, and Taylor about the ability to get high resolution images, I really wanted to think, what can I do with what I already have? How can I highlight that there are some limitations on information and let that be an informing agent to the work that I want to make? So the image on the left here is what was in the archive, but then I started digital manipulations in Photoshop to sort of mirror it and then take different elements of it um, and bitmap. So break down the resolution of the pictures and push them into the background and consider like grids. Um, how do I start thinking about information and relating it to the things that I'm seeing? What are the sort of focal points that are happening in a composition and how are things being layered? And how does that draw, draw information for someone to encounter? But equally, like, where's the joy? Like, I wanted to be really excited about what I was seeing and what I was doing and think about how would someone encounter this? So I took all the information and captured all these images and changed them into these like drawings that were digitally rendered and then started to copy and paste, making shadows, creating bounding boxes, and then layering them one on top of the other to sort of generate this piece that was really kind of trying to show that like what is happening when we stop seeing ourselves in things and start noticing the the, the animals, the environment, and the different currents that are informing some of the stuff that's happening around us. Um, in this instance, I drew up this soapbox derby that has this sort of focal point that's off screen. And so this idea of a race and just being able to catch a glimpse of it so as to suggest that there's something that is happening behind the scenes. And then to take that image and push back people to the background overlaid with a grid to suggest some kind of like digital moment that we may not ever see again. Um, so, I mean, it was a lot of fun to do this, but it also gave me a moment to think about like, how is this also reflecting my, per my particular experience and like, what are the things that I wanted to bring to the table so as to expand the conversation around community and consider what are the various elements that happen once we're no longer here. Uh, I think that's what I wanted to end with. Uh, thank you. Hello, are you ready for me to? All right. Second to just adjust my screen here. So when I started to when I when I received the invitation to work with the to work with the collection at, at Henry Sheldon Museum, um, and then had my appointment with 
Eva and Taylor, I explained that as an artist, I am um, driven by a few things uh, perennially, and that uh, that is the uh, interaction of collage and landscape. Anytime I can bring those two things together, I'm uh, always uh, thrilled to do that. Um, so for this, the piece that I um, I created for the uh, for the show, um, I really had no idea what I was going to find in the collection. All I knew was that I was interested in doing a few things. One, making sure I could point to the history of collage, and two, making sure I could point to the history of landscape. And so those were the two things I had my antennas up for. And um, Eva and Taylor both uh, suggested things that drew my attention to a few documents, which uh, uh, ultimately did um, uh, influence uh, the piece. Um, before I continue, though, I feel the need to describe what it is you're looking at because it's really unusual. Um, so uh, when you think of collage, or when I think of collage, uh, my earliest collages were uh, topical in the sense of placing things on top of a substrate. So take glued paper and you put it on top. And so... Um, I've been making collages for several decades now, um, since the early 80s. And I started wondering, well, what else could collage be? And so I pioneered this technique. I didn't really have an example to look at. Um, but I started wondering, well, what about sideways collage? What if I don't glue on top? What if I everything I cut is put in place a little bit like veneer. So when you see the collage that I just showed you, you have to imagine that things have been cut twice. So for example, if I would like to have this uh, piece of foliage put into my image, I have to cut it out by itself and then put it on top of the place that I want it to go and then trace it with the exacto knife to cut out as close as an exact replica as possible. And so to do this, it's very tricky work because it's so fragile, I can't tape it in place. So you have to imagine holding a thing still, cutting around it so that it can be removed in the exact shape. If I move it, it's no longer the exact shape. So um, all of the work that I've been doing in the last 20 years involves this process of dual cutting removal, insertion, and then taping from behind so the pieces don't fall away. Of course, it leaves me with some interesting residual pieces, which of course I'll find something to do with an, another day. But for 20 years, this is what I've been doing and it keeps giving me ideas. So <laughs> I keep doing it. Um, but so now that you go back to this piece, that means that this element has been cut in place. This element has been printed in place, as is this one. This has been cut into place. The map reticulas are cut into place. This is cut into place. This is cut into place. I've been collecting blank sheets of paper. They're very rare. Uh, they, the, the, I typically find them at the beginnings and ends of books, and finding something this large is really quite challenging. Um, uh, and I often look for um, material that has some sort of history to it. Absolutely love that I purchased this book that nobody wanted for like 25 bucks, but it's filled with pages with water damage. And that's perfectly what I needed. Um, you'll see later on why I ended up selecting this particular piece of paper, because it reminded me of an image I saw in Henry Sheldon's collection. Um, and of course, it feels like a hill in the distance behind Middlebury. Um, the other thing I should mention is that um, I, I publish the materials you see me using. What do I mean by that? Um, I collect paper from different decades, from different centuries. And when I find a, an, a text that I would like to use, 
I typically don't have the funds to support the purchase of that exact text. Plus I have this problem of, I wanna keep the book and then use the book. So I do high resolution scans and then I print on period paper. So in a sense, this piece of paper from the 1800s has text that comes from the 1800s, but I use contemporary technology to blend the two things together. And then in some cases, I transfer the text directly onto the paper as I did in this image and this image. And the way I do that is with a solvent to transfer the, um, uh, uh, the toner. Uh, I use a toner-based process, which if you don't know what toner is, it's in a photocopier. If you ever notice a photocopier coming out warm it's because it goes through heat rollers which fuses the two elements of the toner which is a plastic bead and a carbon uh, uh, pigment and so uh, when you use a a, 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 a a solvent you can actually make the toner um, fugitive and it will actually move to the new surface um, at any rate so what you're looking at is 100 percent fabricated by me and the, the, when I use map uh, graticules, um, they are usually, so I'm sorry, they're exclusively used to, to locate, um, in this case, Addison, Vermont is right on that parallel right there. So um, they're used as pointers. Um, so when I first looked through the collection, I really wasn't sure what I was going to be attracted to or what I was going to find. So I just began to collect images. I'm not going to show you all of them. I'll show you just a, a, a few of them. I just want to get the, con the controls from Zoom out of the way. Okay. Um, and this is actually what made me think of that, uh, that, that piece of paper and why I chose it. Um, this interested me because I'm interested in, in how land is treated, looking for history, uh, of of changing attitudes around land. And for me, the question of community when it relates to land is an interesting one because uh, being invited to do a project on community was really a problem for me because typically I remove people, remove community from my work to isolate a, 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 an understanding of landscape as a way of focusing on it, but also pointing some or indicting <laughs> people for the choices that are made around our global predicament. And so in my choice to remove people, I thought to myself, uh, I've been doing that for 20, well, more than 20 years, 30 years. And uh, I thought, well, how am I gonna, how am I gonna pull this off? So I, I began noticing these types of images and it, um, uh, I eventually was, uh, uh, came to this particular text, which was suggested by Ava and Taylor, uh, which I ended up using pretty heavily in the piece. Um, so the central image that I cho chose came from this historical book. I was grateful to find a beautiful, this particular scan is available on uh, uh, the United States government websites. And so um, I was able to not only um, use the text, but this text was scanned so well that the text is searchable. And so it, it occurred to me to think about, uh, actually, I'm going to have to read to you a section that uh, on the fifth page. Let's see. Uh, sorry, second page. I think it, it is known to all who have any knowledge of the subject that no histories are so interesting to residents, especially descendants of the early inhabitants, as the history of the perils and hardships of the first settlement in their respective towns. And when I read that passage, I read the first 30 pages and, until I found what actually made me have to stop reading and just go make something. Uh, this occurred to me that, oh, I wonder if they're going to talk about the history of Native Americans, of the first peoples. And the first 
mention of the word Indian appears on page 29. And this is what it reads. In what we have to say of the Indians, the original inhabitants of the country of Addison, the county of Addison, it is not our purpose to enter into any learned dissertation on the character, the custom, or the history. Such treatises may be found elsewhere. We regard it as belonging to our provenance to speak only of their residence in the county and of their um, depredations so far only as to affect the county and its settlement, and that not in detail. It is but a very short time since we commenced any inquiries on the subject, but from the accounts we have obtained during our short examination, we find satisfactory evidence in the Indian, uh, in the Indian re uh, relics found in different towns and so on. And so this really occurred to me that, you know, there's this postponement of discussing of this part of the history. And it thought to me that I thought to myself, well, that does not seem like community. When I think of the banding together in a, as a group, and it, it seemed uh, an important thing to identify uh, some of what was happening in the history at that time. And of course, I thought of the Iroquois, five completely separate groups of Native Americans that banded together, um, which in turn inspired Benjamin Franklin to make a, a plea to band together in uh, colonies. And so that history is quite, quite profound, I thought to myself. So I, I knew I wanted to sort of point to that somehow. Um, and it occurred to me when I was looking at the definition of the word collage, I started looking at certain aspects of the word like coal, like the word uh, coal. And it, you know, at the lowest point of a ridge of saddle, okay, a region of slightly elevated pressure between two uh, anti uh, cyclones, interesting. Variant spelling assimilated with together jointly all together. I thought coal is related to calm. Pretty interesting. So the word collage and coal and community are linked. And then when you look at the etymology of the word college, it seems interesting to point out a collection of people. So all of a sudden I found that I had enough material to um to create my work um one of the photographs i found that was just an extraordinary image that i couldn't take out of my head because it's sort of like well once you see it you don't forget like that's quite a burl and so i i earned i looked up the uh the definition of burl and i thought it was interesting that it's the result of some form of stress or injury so here is this idea of injury on the land, the land remembers. Um, and um, what I ended up doing, oops, oh shoot, did I just lose my image? Uh, let me just see if I can find. Okay, well, I can do it this way. All right, so um, what I ended up doing was taking that photograph and translating it in Photoshop, I have a program that can that uh, mimics the the feeling of an engraving. And so I translated that photograph into an engraving to give it the sense that it was a technology from the 1800s. So um, the Iroquois, uh, you know, the the band of uh, of five uh, Native American peoples. This was the their constitution, uh, people of the longhouse. And um, that sense of community was all but forgotten in this account of Addison's history. And so what I so part of what I'm interested in doing in my work is juxtaposing not just history of collage and history of landscape, but I'm interested in how um, image juxtaposition can be with text and text can be with image and text, text and image or text to text. 
So this is the first real comparison between two separate texts that I've um, really engaged with as a collage artist. Um, I'm also interested in uh, definitions and etymology. And even though there's an overlap of definitions for the word community, each dictionary defines it slightly different. And so um, by posing these this group of images together, I hope to raise questions about um, uh, what is community if we selectively forget the members who were here before us is a question that I pose. And, um, you know, what stresses uh, on communities exist when you um, don't include that history uh, as a regular um, part of everyday discourse? Um, I think I can maybe pause there. Hi there, just uh, switching my screen up. All right, we'll just do it this way. So um, as Ava mentioned in the, the beginning of the, uh, uh, of the webinar, I am from Florida, I grew up in Florida. Uh, I went to school in California, but came back. And uh, actually the first time that I ever saw snow, which was uh, at the age of 22, was in Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, and I think because of the, uh, the age that I saw it almost like when you, uh, when you learn how to drive uh, and, and when you're older, uh, I started to notice very specific things. And I was also an artist at that time, so I was uh, kind of looking at the experience uh, in a certain way. And so I noticed, I was fascinated by the sound that the, that the snow made when you step in it, by the, how the body had to uh, be positioned in a certain way uh, in order to walk on ice or impacted snow. And um, all of these things uh, stayed in my mind for a while. My work is uh, usually um, about the uh, this, the concepts of human and what a human is or uh, where our own bodies as humans begin and end. And there's actually a uh, one of my uh, favorite quotes by the artist uh, Jenny Holzer from her series Living is, um, it can be shocking to see your breath in the air or the breath of a crowd uh, you never think that your body extends that far. Um, and so when I uh, later um, in my life, when I lived for a time in DC, which did actively snow, um, I began to learn how to live with snow and how very different it was to live with uh, snow versus what I grew up living in, which is rather temporary uh, conditions like rain or disasters like hurricanes and um, how that changes um, not just the way that you live, but also the way that you live with others. So that I could uh, uh, walk down the street and stomp uh, the uh, snow off of my shoes and see a stranger who's also doing it and we can share a look and know that at that moment, uh, we are in that same physical state together that we might not know each other at all, but we know how the other one, at least to a certain extent, is feeling, and 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 that possibly that this can actually physically connect us, that we can be sort of uh, connected in this way, um, and how that actually works in sort of systems of communities of care and of um, sort of helpfulness, since it is an extended uh, state, a consistent state uh, in which those who live in snow all live. Uh, so when I found myself working uh, with the uh, Children Archives, I, uh, I had that um, immediately in my mind. And I was lucky, unlike um, probably a lot of the other artists, I had just the sheer amounts uh, to work with, considering, of course, how 
uh, how uh, snow is uh, such a uh, sort of consistent presence in Vermont. So in the archives, really just, um, I wanna say I had at least um, you know, 50 images to work with, took a while to source them all. Um, so one of the central uh, sort of uh, elements of this work is uh, the ones that uh, Avon Taylor acquired for me in high resolution. I, 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 can, uh, I confess that at first I, given the sheer amount that I found, um, sort of had to remember that they were uh, sort of uh, had to find all of these for me. So the first that I found was uh, what looked to be the um, the falls, the uh, Middlebury Falls. And I'm just going to see if I can uh, get this. There we go. Uh, the Middlebury Falls, um, which in my, uh, in my, collage uh, appears in uh, two iterations, the first being uh, uh, this one where it, uh, it is a Christmas card. So of course we're going to see snow, but uh, I was really struck by this sort of home boat and this idea of uh, sort of an identity based within snow. And also this, um, uh, this other uh, image from, uh, uh, Middlebury, the fall and winter. It is the the same uh, fall, but in uh, different images and time in different states of freezing. So my uh, collage here is um, using these as a kind of central image. One of the uh, one of the uh, interesting issues that I had was the uh, physical requirements of these collages, which had to be portrait. And of course I'm working from landscapes, uh, sort of working on the idea of a, uh, a landscape. So um, I had to figure out how to um, build up this collage um, kind of within a different orientation that I might, uh, might have done uh, with this, with snow. Uh, previously. So um, the, one of the first things that came to me was this idea of the snowdrift of this kind of buildup um, in time and in a sort of layers of time and snow. Um, so what you see here are these um, sourced images um, that uh, sort of go up uh, with people climbing up or in sort of layers of strata of uh, snow and activities that are being done of uh, of uh, of the way that we move and continue to move and handle snow is sort of this way of connecting us not just through uh, uh, through the shared experience of that moment but also the shared experience of all of these collective moments in time and place. Um, so that was. Uh, in the back of my mind as I was thinking, uh, I was finding all of these images um, to how to express that in a manner, a sort of timeline almost, um, or an accumulation of all of these uh, uh, ways of living with each other and with um, this sort of physical presence um, around you. Uh, in a sort of sustained physical presence. And you notice here, this is one of the few um, images that I found that had uh, color in it. You know, I'm thinking I'm a painter uh, by uh, sort of actively by trade, that's where I got trained in. And while I do have a very, I, I find that collage functions uh, throughout uh, all of my practices, including uh, writing the kind of act of placing one thing after the other. Um, I did want to add some color as a painter, um, but from the the kind of large time frame that I was working in, and from the uh, simple aspect that I'm working with a a bit of weather that is largely uh, white or gray, um, it I was struck by this particular image, and it and it kind of um, served as a guide for the. Um, the collage itself in terms of 
uh, the colors that I sourced and how they, they were built up. Um, so that there are uh, all of these um, uh, figures in the landscape, either uh, walking together through um, the space or sugaring um, as uh, you probably saw in that um, this particular area, which was the postcard, or even cutting uh, blocks of ice, ice blocks, which was actually a fairly uh, frequent occurrence that I found in these archives. Um, so that there was uh, commerce and leisure and uh, sort of uh, play and uh, struggle, um, lots of uh, cars underneath um, underneath layers of snow and lots of snow drifts. Um, and the title of um, of this particular of collage has some meaning. It's called, um, Long enough to write our names on, which is a paraphrase from a Robert Frost poem uh, called Snow. Robert Frost taught at Middlebury College for a time. Um, and the part of the poem that I am uh, paraphrasing is a moment when um, the wind that has picked up snow has been described as a sort of scroll that is um, flying through the air, which creates this sort of sense. It was this kind of kismet sense of verticality that I was trying to alter this particular environment to fit in. Um, but this uh, Middlebury presence is also in the uh, in the collage itself, which what I uh, found out later was is called a skien. Um, in which the uh, the graduating students, um, I think this one and right here in the um, the top uh, half of the collage is from a um, from a 1999 photo of students graduating in the winter in their caps and gowns skiing. So all of these ways that uh, snow has altered the community and has created traditions and has created. Um, these moments of interaction um, was what was uh, really going through my mind at the time when I was making this. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am Christopher Kurtz. I'm a storyteller and collage artist in New Orleans. I'm also the coordinator for Collage Institute. So in addition to contributing a piece of artwork for this project, I also did some of the behind the scenes stuff. And um, it was a real joy getting to work with the Henry Sheldon Museum. And I'm grateful to them for letting us poke around inside of their archive. Um, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. All right. And this is the piece I did for the project. Uh, I call it The Giving Bush. Um, it's an homage to the story The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein, uh, which can be interpreted in many ways, but I've always seen it as a cautionary tale about how we treat the nature that nurtures us. And these are the archival elements I pulled from the Henry Sheldon Museum's collection. Uh, we've got a World War II food administration poster, a wallpaper advertisement, and this illustration of prize-winning sheep. And uh, the spoons in the image, uh, they're, they come from my own materials. Um, I use silverware a lot as a way to reference food or dining culture. And I'll be honest, I'm not much of a historian. Uh, fiction is more my speed. Um, although I like to use history as a way to world build and evoke nostalgia. And so when I browsed the collection, I was looking for images that caught my attention that fell into the kinds of symbolism and iconography that I use all the time anyway. And I really only skimmed the associated histories. Uh, I prefer instead to make up my own stories. And uh, I like to imagine that these sheep have formed their own little community and they gather here at the giving bush for their daily jam and pickled green beans. This is a digital collage, uh, which is not my normal mode of working. I'm an analog collage, collage artist traditionally, but I have been doing a lot more digital collage, um, especially since I began working with archives more as Collage Institute starts doing um, those uh, kinds of projects. 
Um, and I'm going to take us through a little journey of some of my other work because I feel like it all sort of relates um, to these themes that I've been mulling over and, and, and I'm kind of like uh, reiterating as I go through each piece of work and each project that I'm a part of. Um, so in my work, I often play with genre and escapism in order to tell high concept stories that build off of history and ruminate on the future. I'm inspired by science fiction and fantasy and its ability to cradle complex truths about what it means to be human when faced with the utterly inhuman. Often in my collage, there is an element of the unrelenting growth of nature and of entropy toward the structures of humankind. This piece is part of a long-term series that I've been working on that envisions what the world may look like long after some undefined apocalypse. This is called Cats in the Cradle of Civilization. And this is another one in that series. It's called The Bureau of Land Management of the Giants. And I think this series has a lot in common with what I did for artists in the archive. Uh, I'm imagining what nature would look like without us being the dominant species like we are now. Could we learn to coexist with nature or even to live in service to it? Maybe we'll just go the way of the dinosaurs and some hyper-evolved cats will dig up our bones among the lost ruins of our civilization and speculate on what our lives might have been like. Or maybe it's inevitable that when a community forms, they'll place themselves at the center of everything and take and take until there's nothing left to give. Maybe even these cute little sheep are bound to drain the giving bush of every last drop of jam it has to offer. These are a couple of pieces from a series I did called Food Desert. Uh, and as someone who worked in restaurants and bakeries, I was a head baker at a bakery for a long time, and I'm still passionate about food culture. I love to eat. Um, but this series was a chance for me to question my own hypocrisies. Um, I think there's important work to be done surrounding food equity, and some of that work begins with those questions. This piece is called A uh, Monument to Science and Discovery, uh, a slightly more hopeful work that I did for a similar archive-based project that Collage Institute did called Empty Columns Are a Place to Dream. And again, I'm cultivating growth among the ruins. I'm imagining megaflora that takes over and beautifies all of the concrete jungles that we've built. I'm hoping that science and discovery don't become the great destroyer, but instead the great equalizer. And so all of that work I had done previously informed what went into creating this piece. I'm thinking about what we build and what we leave behind not just for our communities, but for the land and the animals that allow our communities to exist. Something else that inspired me while making this piece and uh, was my own um, experiences living in New Orleans. Um, when hurricanes and more recently tornadoes cause damage to people's homes and lives, the community shows up in force uh, with food and water and help. And we maintain community fridges throughout the city we love our community gardens and our farmers markets. We are a city that is tied together by food. And sustainability has become an important topic here as well, which gives my cynical heart a little hope. Um, I believe that the cyclical nature of our relationship with Earth's resources require us to take care of that which takes care of us. Thank you. And I think now we're going to do an audience Q&A. So uh, if you have questions, um, please put them in the chat or use the Q&A feature. And uh, Taylor is going to um, moderate that for us. Um, also, Allison, I wanted to say your piece made me want ice cream. Perfect. <laughs> All right, well, well, we're waiting for some questions to come in from the audience. Um, Thank you all so much. Um, and I will go ahead and throw out a question to the group um, and whoever would like to can bite. Um, so this was obviously a kind of intensely place-based project, but none of you actually were with us in the place where this collection um, was based. So I'm curious if any of you have any reflections, um, maybe those of you who haven't done a virtual residency like this before, what the experience of working with such an intensely local collection um, was from, you know, very far flung places or, you know, less far flung places for those of you in, in Massachusetts. Um, 
yeah, I'd be curious to hear um, to hear any thoughts. So I was actually in Spain at the time of this residency. So to just, you know, still no snow in Spain. Um, but there was something about, you know, the, uh, the consistency of the meetings, the, and how it kind of fell, you know, after having been digital with everybody else um, in, uh, in our lives for the most part, um, it felt strangely, maybe because I personally had adjusted, it felt strangely natural to do it this way. Um, since we were all kind of adapting uh, to kind of finding a way to transport ourselves uh, across these distances, uh, I think, you know, talking with you all and also just kind of burying ourselves in this archive um, allowed at least, you know, a some semblance of kind of placemaking in a way in which, um, and we were given these, uh, this, this evidence. And it is helpful, of course, at least for me that I've, you know, that I have at very least been to the state of Vermont before. Um, but I think, um, it did add a sort of an interesting kind of consistency to it all, since we all were giving prints, uh, giving prints, and a lot of us also did digital collages. I would just add to what Allison was saying. I thought it was really liberating, honestly. I mean, we could just get as uh, into it as as much as as we wanted because there was so much online and then having the debriefs and talking to you and, and Ava about like what we were interested in to hear what your suggestions were um, gave a more human element to engaging with what usually is stuff in boxes um, and stuff that's really dusty and in, that hasn't been touched in a long time. So to have those interactions really made it feel um, more vibrant as it were. Um, for, for me, uh, I, uh, I didn't think to actually include in my slideshow things I discovered when I was at the museum. Eva gave me this great tour of a handful of things inside the, the special locked space. Yeah. And I was, you know, it's just my, my, my eyes and my interest was just like exploding. So seeing the tactile, the analog, the physical materials of the actual museum, I was thrilled that I was able to visit the museum a couple of times over the fall. That that it's you know would have been a primary experience of of great interest for me personally to begin this project. But we worked remotely, and for the past twenty years, I've evolved a practice that is a mixture of analog and. Uh, and digital. So I was quite at home, <laughs> you know, and as a teacher having to navigate the Zoom territory, it was all totally, I was right there, ready to go. So for me, it was, there was, it was like, I didn't even think twice about the opportunity. I was like, oh, great. Oh, you have all of your work digitized. I was as pleased as can be. And I actually looked at every single document. <laughs> so in fact, you know, pulling things out and selecting was such a hard thing to do. My trouble was, you know, not being as thorough as I wanted to be. <laughs> so I probably could spend, you know, I could probably could make a, a bazillion pieces more because of all the things that still draw my attention. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but it's a good one. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. And you know, it was an interesting experience for Eva and me to think about what materials we wanted to share with you all, because you all got an incredibly kind of curated version of the collection built to begin with around Eva's and my interests and what was visually appealing to us, what was thematically appealing to us. So, um, you know, in a kind of behind the scenes sort of ghost-like way, there's the presence of Eva. <laughs> and I and our sort of understanding of our the archive that we're working with um, in all of your work. Um, so a couple of questions about the, oh, just, Eva, did you, just, you want to I jump in? I just wanted to 
thank you guys because the fact that we provided solace and some sort of stability during this difficult time is incredibly rewarding to hear and also the comment that everything is digitized and, and and that we have such mass material online is completely shocking to me because we always feel like we have such fraction of materials available and and obviously we were a little apprehensive with Taylor thinking that perhaps you guys won't have enough or it won't uh, it won't provide enough stimulation but it's just a, a wonderful thing to hear that it's otherwise so thank you so much thank you um, so two questions from Donna Caffrey. Um, one just about the the time frame for this project. So if I recall correctly, it was about a month from beginning to end. Um, and that involved periodic meetings um, with us, the archivists, and then um, some work among the artists um, themselves, which segues into Donna's next question about how this residency was a kind of virtual community. Um, and she's wondering if this group of artists um, affected how you worked um, and the, the finished products that you came up with. Well, I, I'll, I'll add that um, it kind of did because we had an opportunity to get together and share some of our work as we were doing it and also pose questions about some of the concepts that you know, we were engaging with um, and get feedback on how people were receiving the what they were hearing in the ideas and what they were potentially seeing in some of the, the initial you know, sketches or drafts of work. So that was really helpful. Um, I don't know, Allison, is there something or Kurt, Christopher? I, I guess it, it's worthwhile to point out that um, although we had, uh, was it weekly Zoom meetings? We had sort of consistent Zoom meetings uh, during the month that we were doing this. There was also a, a Slack kind of discussion board that were, where there was sort of consistent uh, kind of uh, talk between the artists and branching off even from the work that was being done to other. Um, so there really was a kind of uh, consistent uh, stream of communication between us and not just um, limited to uh, the Zoom meetings, which was very helpful. And it really helps to create this kind of uh, shared experience. This opportunity to advertise a little bit. Um, we do a lot of these virtual residencies through Collage Institute, and um, we try to make them a community. Um, uh, we we think uh, our philosophy around it is that you know we we invite uh, guest speakers, and we have these projects, and we have you know a, a sort of schedule to meet each week. Um, but we also feel that the people who are invited to join these residencies are are just as important, if not more important, than any sort of guest speaker or, or thing like that. Um, they all bring these different experiences to the table um, and uh, and uh, build on one another in that way. Um, and several of our residencies have resulted in like a continued community, um, people who uh, keep talking long after the residency has ended. So I guess that makes me the anomaly because <laughs> my my first time meeting any artist involved in the show is today. <laughs> So I am Hello. thrilled to meet the other artists, and it was so amazing to hear you talk about your works. It's I, my my head was just going a thousand miles a minute. So for me, uh, that being a, a full time high school art teacher, but also being involved with two things that were really drawing my attention. One was planning a a project with um, Collage Magazine and uh, uh, doing a, a course together that was also commencing around the same moment. And so a lot of attention was there, but I was also curating a, a show which was in another country. And I had to wrap my round around three very big things all at the same time. So I was not able to participate actually in the Slack, which I greatly regret. So this, it, this moment of connection is pretty dear to me. So I would have th been thrilled to have been more connected in the other way, but I was not able to do that. So. 
um, I think I'm the anomaly. And interestingly enough, I I typically make art about not having people involve the landscape. So <laughs> there's a kind of a weird poetry there or symmetry there. Not intended. <laughs> Um, we have a question from Virginia who says these collages looked at materials from the past to comment on the idea of community and how we think about it today. What direction do you think this project would have taken with the same prompt, but with contemporary sources? Um, what do you think would shift about how you approached community in terms of our relationship with nature and climate? would have been even more cynical. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know um, from my perspective, if I was really trying to tune into an audience that I hadn't met yet, uh, that would be going into the Sheldon and seeing the work in person. So I wanted to bring elements that were um, hitting at different levels and audiences, right? So young to old. But if we were thinking in terms of things being more contemporary, Latinx as an identity didn't really have any kind of like markers before like 2015. So there was a whole language that, like I said, I, I could borrow now and use as an active agent that I wouldn't have access to in the Sheldon uh, collection because um, those stories didn't have language in that time. And it would be from my point of view, unfair to try to cast them through my contemporary lens into historical materials. But you can take historical materials and start trying to tell the story of how we engage with them today. And so it might, might be more cynical, but it also might open up a whole different way of seeing what is happening um, with the collection and how it interacts with contemporary society, I think. <laughs> I mean, I agree with Ren. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, I think our final question then um, is from Selena. Um, and so we've grouped you, all of your works um, and you, your participation in this, in this residency, in this exhibit, were grouped together for this talk tonight under the category of beyond human. Um, and so Selena is wondering if any of you would just like to speak a little bit more to how you connect, how your work connects um, to this kind of name tag of beyond human. I know I for one was really jazzed when I saw the kind of heading for this webinar, um, since it is so close to, you know, the kinds of things that I already think about. And it seems like that's the case for most of not all of us, that there's a lot of um, kind of overlap about, you know, what it means to be human, what it means to not be human, um, and all of the, you know, how these things are connected um, and, and, and how they kind of switch uh, kind of categories from one to the other. Uh, so easily. I, I love hearing you say that, Allison. I, I'm I'm right there with you. I um, one of the things that drives my work is having discovered years ago that the definition of nature excludes humanity, which is a Cartesian idea, and so um, that's partly what drives me to ironically and kind of sarcastically pull people out of the picture to to show the hubris of that idea. So, but in, in, you know, in the truth of it, I'm definitely about people and uh, I, I root for us and we're, we're, we're doing a terrible job collectively with the way we've so quickly evolved in the last 200 years is extraordinary. And so to sort of tie in the last question, uh, I, um, wait, can you, oh my goodness, I just lost my train of thought forming that sentence. Could you remind me what the previous question was? Uh, the previous question was uh, thinking about how your work might have changed had this been using contemporary materials with the same prompt. So we've grown, thank you for that. We've grown so quickly 
I suspect that we've forgotten some of the wisdom of the past. So that's partly why the now it needs to have the reminder of the past, I guess, is what I was thinking there. But with regard to the humanity of it, I think, uh, I, like Allison, I am thrilled to be in this grouping um, because it allows me to talk about things I don't normally talk about. I, I like to think of, or one of the things that I hardly, I'll never put in print, but I'll say one to, to people in a group or one-on-one -on -one with someone that what drives my work is often thinking about um, redefining the Christian tr trinity so that I grew up with, absorbing, that for me, the trinity is you, meaning the community that I am a part of, Right now, we have this nice virtual community in all different locations. And then there's me. I'm one member of that community. And then there's the place that we traverse the land. And then how do we interact together? So for me, it's a very spiritual question. So I think this last question that you got is actually pretty poignant for our group. And so the 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 sensitivity to pull this title together I think, is evidence of uh, a, a, a very deep understanding of um, how our particular work um, outfits the show in a kind of a unique way. So I'm thrilled to be in this group because it allows us to concentrate in, a, I think, a very unique way. I echo everything that was just shared regarding this question. And I also think that it's such a great like grouping because it activates different things. And as I think about what Beyond Human is, it, it's really engaging with what happens after we're gone. And what we are leaving behind as our legacy or as our heritage um, is information and, and markers that all signify in like binary code in some ways, not just numerically, but absence and presence, right? Ones and zeros. And how does that start to resonate with what we can do today to improve upon what we are leaving behind when we are no longer here. And there's a lot to be said. And I think, you know, talking about how the environment is impacting us and talking about how we are, you know, consuming and how we are present in space are all kind of very critical. And also how we relate to those and things that the things around us are critical. And so, um, yeah. I, I see it as a relation of absences and presences and thinking about what we leave behind. Uh, yeah, I, I really appreciated this opportunity because um, I think sometimes in my art making, I feel a little bumbling or like I don't really know what I'm doing. Uh, and this, this gave me an opportunity to sit down and really think it through. And I feel like I learned a lot of things about my own work and my own process. Um, uh, considering under this heading of beyond human. Um, and I think I have a tendency to feel a little hopeless about the future of humanity. And my art is a way to process that. But I also find hope in the art that I make and other people make around this topic. Um, and, uh, and I hope that it feeds people and, um, and changes some minds if it can. Great. Well, I think that'll bring us to the end of our Q&A and the end of our program tonight. Um, so I will pass it back over to Eva if she has any parting words. Um, but thank you to all four of you for joining us. Um, and thank you to everyone who was in the audience tonight. We're so appreciative that you joined us on a Wednesday evening. So I thank you so much to all of you here, all Todd, Ren, Alison, and and uh, Christopher, and of course to Taylor as usually, and I hope that you can join us next month. And I just, for those of you who don't know, there is this book, Artists in the Archives, which was published, good, Christopher, <laughs> <laughs> published um, to, um, uh, to <laughs> wonderful, everybody has it, but if you don't have it, you can buy it in our museum store, and I'm sure Christopher will also offer it through a Collage Institute. So um, uh, this uh, particular program will be also recorded. All our former pro uh, programs are recorded already on our website. If you have any questions, 
contact us and uh, thank you so much and good night. Thank you. Thank you.